Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for this time together, for this time in your word. And Lord, I, my prayer is that we just be led by your spirit in all that we do, Lord. You're, you said that you would send your spirit to lead us into all truth. And your son, Jesus, said he is the truth. So we just pray, Lord, that your spirit would lead us into a deeper knowledge, understanding, and relationship with your son, Jesus, through our time in the word. Help us, Lord God, to see wonderful things in your word, but above all, to see Jesus more clearly that we might more nearly be like Him. I just praise you and thank you for your work in our lives. Amen. 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 All right, we're, we're kind of continuing on in our study that's been going on uh, for, what now, four weeks, I guess, mm -hmm. looking at Lazarus coming out of the tomb into new life. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about the basic part of that. I mean, what, what the Lord had put on my heart in the beginning of that when we started this as a one-week study <laughs> was that we want to look like Jesus. Mm -hmm. We want to imitate Jesus. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about in this study a little bit, mm -hmm. the imitation of Jesus Christ. This morning we went to a prayer meeting in Oldham at the salt cellar. It's supposed to be a, a pastor's prayer meeting. And the person that was leading that started out by reading from Psalm 8. Mm -hmm. And while I don't, I've always said you shouldn't have favorite scriptures. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I say that somewhat facetiously because I think anybody who spends time in the Word kind of winds up with some favorite scriptures. Yes. But I also say that that's just a really good indication that we don't have had the revelation out of the rest of the scriptures that we should. Because every word, is every scripture, all scripture, Paul writes to Timothy, is God-breathed. It is the very breath of God. And it reveals him, his plan for us. So sometimes we get into some scriptures and we just haven't had that revelation yet. So uh, I, I say all of this as a, to, to, as a prelude to this statement, Psalm 8 has to be one of my favorite scriptures. And, and the reason for that is that was the very first time that the Lord spoke to me. Mm -hmm. 34 years ago, when I sat down at a kitchen table, something mm -hmm. like this, and said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to know about it. And I went over and I flipped open, my, flipped over to Alice's Bible. I, of course, didn't have a Bible, didn't have any time in a Bible, didn't, didn't own a Bible, didn't read a Bible, had no understanding of the Bible. But I flipped open the Bible and uh, opened right to Psalm 8. Mm. And that was a, a time that God spoke to me so powerfully. Uh, and just to share very, very briefly about that, it, it was the fact that uh, uh, while I had as an unsaved person a very, I was filled with pride. And pride is something we all still deal with. But, yes. uh, and prior to that time, I had all this pride. We had Alice and I had had a fair amount of success in the world, and I felt very good about myself. I was very proud of myself. I thought, you know, we, I had sports cars, I had fancy cars, we had had a big house, and you know, like just a lot of stuff. And, a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of stuff. And that had been the measure, my measure of what was worthwhile. Was mm -hmm. those things. And yet, I would go out on a starry night, and I'd look up into the sky. And as puffed up as I always felt when I looked at other people, looked at when I looked into the sky, I would feel so totally, absolutely insignificant. Mm -hmm. And the reason I would feel so insignificant was because I, I would think to myself, I'm looking at stars that, you know, as an unsaved person, I've just been there for zillions of years, give or take. And yet here I am, and back then, 30 some odd years ago, I thought, well, if I live 50 years, that's a lot. And yet I'm looking at light that left there thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when I opened up the Bible to Psalm 8, I read these words. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him? Well, that was exactly what was in my heart. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I consider the moon and the stars, what's man compared to that? And I heard... For the first time in my life, I heard the voice of God speak to me. And He said to me, 
not only am I real, but I know exactly what's in your heart. And I sat at that table and I began to just weep. I mean, it was like I had asked a question and he had answered. I said, Jesus, are you real? And I found out that, that day, yes, how very, very real he, he is. And it changed my life. That was a, a, a life-changing experience. And I sat there and went through the Word and God just spoke to me. The point of all that is that I've shared that testimony around the world for, for decades. That how I was humbled by the moon and the stars. Mm -hmm. Sometime back I was preaching at a church in uh, Winter Park, Florida. Winter Park Church, as a matter of fact, yeah. where we have a dear friend, um, Brother Robert Dunlap, who's a pastor. And I was sharing the same thing. I don't know what the context was why I was sharing that, that testimony. But as, oh, I was talking about pride. That's yeah, why I was right, sharing it. Right, yeah. And as I was speaking, and I was going to say the same thing that I always say, you know, when I looked at, at the, the heavens and saw this massive, uncountable number of stars, how I was humbled. And even as I started to say that I was standing in front of this congregation preaching, once again I heard the voice of God. And he said to me, it wasn't the stars that humbled you. He said it was my glory that humbled you. You see, it says that the heavens proclaim the glory of God. It was His glory that humbled me. After all those years, decades, and this verse being so important, or these verses being so important, all of a sudden I had a new revelation. I saw something new. But sometime after that, I was thinking to myself, just kind of meditating on the Word, and I went back here and I read this. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, you know, a lot of us look up at the stars. Yes. Mm -hmm. I guess we all do. Yeah. I guess man always has been drawn to look upward, yes. to look into the sky and, and see this and and be amazed by the creation of God, whether they, whether they recognize and attribute it to God or not, they're still mm -hmm. amazed by it. But very few of us consider it. Yeah. Very few of us actually consider the moon and the stars. It's just kind of a glancing thought. And I, I sat there and as I was meditating, I was thinking, when I consider, when I meditate, when I really think about the moon and the stars, because, you know, the Apostle Paul says in the first chapter of Romans that the divine nature of God mm -hmm. is revealed by what He has created. Yes. Yeah. So we learn things, we see things, we have revelation from God in what He has created. Mm -hmm. And I realized I never really, I never considered the moon and the stars, His creation. Mm -hmm. And other than now I knew that it revealed His glory, it's like, okay, there's more. There's mm -hmm. more. Yeah. There's always more. Yeah. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We attribute that to the Word of God, and well, we should. But it's like God speaking to us is always, it's ongoing and it's new and it's fresh. And no matter how much, how long you've been in the Word, He can give you fresh revelation, new. He can speak to you and new through it. So, that brings me to the point, finally. I was saying that for, so we've been in the United Kingdom and we've been traveling on this trip now for the last two months. It's, uh, we've been here just over two months, as a matter of fact. And we've been blessed. I've had opportunity to preach in London and in Manchester and Wales and Ireland and Scotland. And the message has been consistent. Mm. The imitation of Jesus Christ. Mm. Mm -hmm. That we, the people of God, the Church of God, the Bride of Christ, we need to look like Jesus Christ. Mm. And I've been using the term over and over and over that we are to imitate Him. Mm -hmm. Now, I use the New American Standard Version of the Bible. And that yeah. word is used a number of times. Mm -hmm. For example, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Be ye therefore imitators. imitators of God, beloved children, and walk in love. Mm -hmm. um, in Philippians chapter 2, another just stirring, beautiful, beautiful word where Paul says that we should have the same mind. We should imitate Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But there's a sense of something that God began to speak to me yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. And it's this. We want to act like Jesus. We, we should. We should want to act like Jesus. Yes. We should want to speak like Jesus. We should want to look like Jesus. 
But when all is said and done, we don't ever replace Jesus. Yeah. No. You know, and this imitation, there's such a, there's like a nuance here. What God doesn't want us to do is walk around and try and be a robot. Be, well, robotically imitate Him. Mm -hmm. He wants to reveal Himself through, through us. us. It's John the Baptist saying, I must decrease that he might increase. It's like we disappear and Christ appears. Yes. It's, not us, it's not us imitating him. It is him, yeah. all of a sudden, who's visible right. through us. Yeah, right, right. I have died and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus, the Apostle Paul says. Mm. So it's, it's far deeper than trying to imitate Jesus. Mm. Yeah. It is allowing Jesus, Jesus come to forth. come forth and be visible through your life. Mm. Yes. Right? And thinking about that, and meditating on this word in Psalm 8, mm -hmm. something else came to me, and I'll, I'll read this to you, because I like to go back to the beginning. And the beginning, of course, is Genesis. in the beginning. Yeah. Bereshith is in Hebrew. The Bible starts with these words, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that's a good place to start. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That, by the way, is my statement on evolution, on science, on everything. In the beginning, God created. But it says in that first chapter of Genesis, in the 16th verse, because, you know, God said, let there be light. Mm -hmm. And He created the day and the, and the night. Mm -hmm. And it says, God made the two great lights, the greater light, the sun, to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. Mm -hmm. The greater light and the lesser light. Well, you know, Jesus said to the apostles, work while it's still day, the night is coming. Well, Christ has left the, the planet. Mm -hmm. you know, I, they used to always say of Elvis Presley, Elvis has left the building. Mm -hmm. Well, Christ has left the building. Trust me on this. Not that he's not coming back. <laughs> Elvis ain't coming back. Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is right. Mm -hmm. We are the lesser light. Yes. yes. Okay? Because now Jesus was the light of the world. Now we are the light. We bring that light. We bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Yeah. But all it is is a reflection of His light. We don't generate any light. Yes. We have nothing in us. Even our own good works are as filthy rags, the Word of God says. Yeah. So it is indeed Christ who is still the light. Mm -hmm. But if I consider... God's creation, what I see is there is light. It's the sun. Mm -hmm. The untouchable, unapproachable source of all power is the sun. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Yes. And we can't... It's, it, you know what? It's a consuming fire. Mm. Yes. Man has landed on the moon. He isn't about to land on the sun. No, that's right. yeah. Because it's a consuming fire. And of course the Word of God says that our Lord is, is a consuming, consuming fire. fire. Yeah. That's right. But it provides all the light. And yet, if you go out on a, on a night that there's a full moon, if it's cloudless yeah. night, I mean, you know, there'll be so much light from the moon yes. that it casts shadows. Yes. But that's only a reflection. Yes. The moon doesn't generate right. any light yes. whatsoever. Yes. That's us. We are that lesser light yeah. because we are to reflect. Mm the light of Jesus Christ yeah. into the darkness of the world. Mm. There's a difference between doing that and imitate. We're not imitating the sun. The moon doesn't imitate the sun. No, it doesn't. No, it just reflects it. It yeah. just reflects it's the sun. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought to myself, there's a great, great lesson here. There's a great revelation of God's nature and God's plan mm -hmm. in looking and considering the moon, the stars, and the work of His hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the sun. Yes. And the revelation is is basically this. Well, let's just uh, talk about this because it's different than the imitation of Christ. And that's what I wanted yeah. to talk about in relationship to the Bible study yeah. that we're doing. And I, I said this to you today because we were talking about this a little bit. And I said, had I or any other man mm -hmm. set out to build this world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was our. <laughs> Hello. Hello, is that you calling? <laughs> That's God. <laughs> okay. Okay, you want to be nosy? That's our, our tea, our evening dinner, getting ready. There's something ringing over there because we're having 
folks in tonight uh, for fellowship. <clears throat> if we had planned this, mm -hmm. and we wanted to put something up in the sky to reflect the light of the sun, mm -hmm. boy, we would have picked, we would have, we would have put a mirror up there. Yeah. And we would have polished it as fine. Yeah. We, we would have hired NASA to send spaceships up there. Mm -hmm. The astronauts just to polish this mirror to its perfection so it would reflect. But the moon yes. is a rock. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything, and, and boys and girls, you can do this as an experiment at home. Tonight, in the pitch of dark of night, get a little rock, get a flashlight, and go out and shine the flashlight on the rock. It's not what you would choose to do. Mm -hmm. Get a flashlight and shine it on the mirror or something really bright yeah. and shiny. And, yeah. and yet God chose a rock to reflect his light. Mm -hmm. It says he chooses the foolish of the world to shame the wisdom of the wise. Mm -hmm. He uses, he shames the, the strength of the, of the strong by, using, by choosing the weak. Mm -hmm. This is a revelation of that. He has chosen... This, this ball of rock to reflect his light into the darkness of the world. Yeah. Now, we've learned how to make electricity and start fires and stuff like that, but the only God-given source of light at night, I mean, is the moon and the stars. Right? So let's start with that fact. Can I just interject something? Please do. Um, when you talked about the moon being the rock, and that is, Jesus said that he's he our, is our rock. Yes, he's our rock, yes. Uh, it's just, it's it just the idea connects. that God chooses, he doesn't, he doesn't require our perfection to show forth his glory. All we got to do is be there. That's it. Yeah. Be available. And, you know, if you have a really, really powerful, I mean, desperately powerful telescope, Mm -hmm. You want, may want to take that out on a bright night, a cloudless night, mm -hmm. when the moon is full, and point it up at the moon, mm -hmm. and you'll notice that the moon is not floating through space going, <laughs> trying to be bright. Mm -hmm. It's just there and available to yeah. God. Yeah. And one of the greatest qualifications to being used by God is just being there and available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. That's what you're going to do. That's it. Show up. Yeah. And be available for him. And he will shine this light off of you and shine it into the world. So thinking about that, and, and just by the way, I actually preached this as a sermon uh, a, a year ago. Years ago. And it's, I called it high school science because it's like, it's only high school science talking mm -hmm. about the moon and stars, but it's a revelation of God. Mm -hmm. And it's that, that sermon is on Bible Talk website. If you go to www.bibletalk.com and look at Radio Free Bible Talk and go to sermons, you'll see this here, which mm -hmm. will give you a much deeper uh, look into this. But there were a few things that I realized. If you go out on any given night, let's just forget clouds for a moment. Mm -hmm. There are some nights when the moon is big and bright, yes. mm -hmm. yes. and there are some nights when the moon is only a sliver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The moon still is exactly the same. Nothing has changed about the moon. Certainly nothing has changed about the sun. That's right. The only thing that has changed when the moon is not giving off that bright light now is the fact that it, the, the earth or the world has come between the sun, the sun and the moon. And, the moon. Mm -hmm. and so it blocks mm -hmm. part of that light. That's right. I think there's a great revelation here Absolutely. when it comes to understanding our desire to be like Christ mm -hmm. and reflect His light. And that is, the only thing that can block His light in your life is the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you allow the world to come between you and Jesus Christ, oh, really? yes. it, Which yeah. it dims, to the extent that you do that, yeah. it dims that light of the sun yeah. being shown in and reflected yeah, off the right. And you yeah. stop and think about when the moon is full, I mean, yeah. when it's really out there, yeah. full, that's when people seem to always look up, look at it. Yes. It's when it's a sliver, they'll take a glance and say, oh, right, that's right. it. Yeah. But when it's full and shining bright, that's yeah, when you get it's the so attention. It's it's because it's beautiful. It's, yes. It really is. And it's so impressive. It's so wonderful. And yet it's still nothing but a rock. That's right. 
Yeah. And that's how we should be. Jesus but, light on right. it. Yeah. But the, the thing that draws man to it, mm. and man has always so been drawn to yeah. that full moon. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Is the reflection of the light of the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the whole idea. Men should be looking at us. The world mm -hmm. should be looking at us and have that same sense of awe. Yeah. Not because of us or who we are, no. but, but because of the reflection yeah. of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Off of us. Yeah. And he said if I be high and lifted up, I will draw all oh, men unto me. So there's a lot, there's a lot more that we can learn from this for sure. I, you know, I, I was saying that, but I think that's important. I think there's there so many interesting facts. Uh, for example, you know, we only ever see one side of the moon mm -hmm. that's right. because of the nature of the rotation of yeah. the Earth and the rotation yeah. of the moon. Yeah. We one side of the moon is always, always In hidden from us. Okay. But the key there is that's true of every Christian. Yes. There, there's a part of every Christian that the world will never ever see. That's mm -hmm. right. But God sees. That's right. Only yeah. God will see it. But God sees. Mm. You know, there's a part of us that we keep in. Mm. There's a yeah, part yeah. of us that's just, it's our nature to try and hide it from, yeah. from people. Mm -hmm. Th there's something in us, I mean, that nobody will ever see. This is what God spoke to the prophet Samuel when he said, Man judges by outward appearance. Mm -hmm. We look at the moon, we see, but well, we see the same thing yeah. all the time. But God searches the heart. Mm -hmm. He sees parts of us that no man will ever see. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And that's a good thing to know. Because that shouldn't be a cause for fear. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a cause for... It should be a, a sense of joy. That Comfort. God knows us. Not only does God know us better than any other human does. Mm -hmm. He knows us better than we, we do, do ourselves. Yes. Yeah. I'm, yes. I mean, if I ask any human being, how many hairs on your head? Who has a clue? But God, God knows. But God knows. That's right. He has that intimate knowledge of us mm -hmm. that is supposed to be a comfort to us. That's right. And it is a comfort when you understand His amazing grace. The mm -hmm. fact yeah. that He's willing to shine His light on you, even though yeah. you're very, very imperfect. And interestingly enough, if you look at the moon with a telescope, what you'll see is imperfection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's because it's been bombarded and hit over and over and over. And I, I, I've actually read that one of the reasons that it reflects well is because of all, the, all of the pock marks, all of the, mm. the you know, it, it, that helps. It. Well, when we have things strike us, yes. mm -hmm. like the, all those craters on the moon are because it's been s struck by asteroids or whatever it gets struck by, things flying through space, ice cream crust, whatever it hits it. But when, when we get struck, and we respond the way we're supposed to. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We exult in our tribulations. Peter and James leaving, you know, the temple having been beaten yeah. for proclaiming the name of Jesus and rejoicing in that. Yes. The light shines ever brighter mm -hmm. yeah. because of that. So I, there's just this, I guess what I wanted to talk about, I mean, just the, the point is, while it's, it's a reasonable thing to say, that we should have a passionate, burning desire to imitate Jesus. Mm -hmm. We need to remember all the time, it's not about our ability uh, you know, to, to imitate Him the way a world imitator comes out you know, and, and talks. We just need to reflect Him. Mm -hmm. we, in, we just need to allow His light, His love, all of His divine attributes mm -hmm. to reflect off of us and touch people in the world. Right. And you know that's why we've been given the word. Peter says we've been given every all of his promises, all of his magnificent promises. Peter says mm -hmm. that we might be partakers of his divine nature. Mm -hmm. So we need to get to that place where we understand that the world and getting involved with the world, allowing the world to, to come between us and the Lord, mm -hmm. hides his light. From, from the world. Mm -hmm. Now, unlike the moon, we can step out. We can separate ourselves from the world and the things of the world. We can, we can say that they're unimportant to us. Mm -hmm. You know, the moon can't, the moon's locked in its rotation. Mm -hmm. We are bound to Christ Jesus, but we have a choice of whether the earth, the moon, I mean, the, the, the world comes between us and Him. Mm -hmm. And that's a choice we have to make. But you need to understand that to whatever extent 
you allow the world to come between you and him, it hides that light. It dims that yeah. light of his love. It dims that light of, of you know, just his glory shining into the world. Yeah. Yeah, we're stopping his flow. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to just interrupt the Bible study to say Alice is getting up to check the food. Yeah. However, you, you should know that Alice is getting up to check the food, so it's, it's quite all right. I'm not going to change a verse and say, you know, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. You know, but we still eat some bread here once in a while, so she's preparing that meal. How can we make sure that we're doing, that we're making ourselves available, that we're there and available yeah. for Jesus? That that becomes the question. And, and I've said it's like when we're talking about Lazarus who came out of the tomb and he is still wrapped in these burial garments. Yeah. And, and those burial garments are all of the things that we've carried into the tomb. You went into the tomb with the burial garments. Yeah. And now we, we come out with them and we've got to get rid of those things in our life. Mm -hmm. The difference with Jesus was when he came out of the tomb, the burial garments were left behind. Yeah. Right? Those are the things from our past. But those are the things that block that light from reflecting. That's like mm -hmm. the world. Yeah. There are things between us because, you know, the things that we're wearing are not us. Mm -hmm. Those burial garments are most assuredly not, not us. us. Mm -hmm. They are the things between us and the Lord yes. that, that block, the the blockage, yeah. that yeah, block yeah, His yeah. light. A lot of the traditions that we have in the church stand between us and the glory of the Son. Yeah. A lot of the old beliefs that we have, well, the attitudes that we carried into this new life, are those things that block His light. Yes. And you, you know, a lot of I, I just don't want to see it caught up in striving so hard to do good works mm -hmm. or to you know to turn to try and generate the light ourselves. That's yeah. I guess that's and the I point. think that's what the good works are. It's us. Trying, to, trying to generate yeah. the light. So now, you see, it says let your, let your works, your good works, be done in such a way yeah. that people see them and give glory to God. God. Yes. But the, it, what that such a way is, is it, again, it's just you recognize that it's not you doing the work. No. Because it says our good works are as filthy rags. Right. It's it is God working, working through, through us. us. So it's not even our good works. No. So it, so it always comes back to just this concept of allowing God to be visible. That He has to be the one who is visible, not yes. us. Yeah, right. okay. And when we start putting denominational names, and we start putting buildings around us, and remember, He said He won't live in that in a building made by the hands of man. Mm -hmm. We start adding, well, what we're doing is, once again, even though we may think it's quote-unquote religious, and mm -hmm. even though we may think that these things are pleasing to God, oftentimes all we're doing is we're, we're stacking things between us and Him mm -hmm. that block that light. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And when the, the light is blocked, it can't reflect. I, you know, I, I'm absolutely convinced that most of the church today thinks that the, the unsaved people, the world, are so attracted to the glory of our buildings, you know, that they're going to come rushing in and get saved. How silly are we? How yeah. how poorly have we learned? How uh, deceived? How deceived are we when mankind has been building temples and these works of His hand since the Tower of Babel? That's right. Mm. That's right. And God said, "Down." When man built a temple, Herod's temple was one of the wonders of the world, mm. and the apostles themselves were so overwhelmed with the awe of this temple mm. and pointed it out to Jesus, and He said, "That's coming down." But He is a temple. And we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are the church that's being built up living stones. Yes. And those stones can reflect His light brighter than any worldly mirror ever made. Mm. If we just make ourselves there. And we don't try and take the glory. Mm. No, nothing comes between us and the light of God as much as wanting to share His glory, to take His glory. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you do that? By wanting to take credit for the work. Yeah. You know? Uh, 
I go to churches and I've had churches tell me about how many people they saved. Hmm. The only one who ever saved anybody was Jesus Christ as He hung on a cross yes. and prayed, Father, right. we, the church doesn't save anybody. The church doesn't make anybody holy. Mm -hmm. The church, oh, do we, the purpose of the church, God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of service. The work of service is to be available to Jesus Christ. And let Him, we're training people to let Jesus work through them in such a way that He becomes visible, not us. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that require that you imitate Him? Yes. It requires that you imitate Him in the sense you need to be like Him. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not so much that you're showing Him then as much as you're staying out of the way then. Right. Yeah. Because it's like we talk too much. This is from a professional talker. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. But it says, If any man speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be slow to speak, quick to listen. Yeah. Because like Jesus, we're to hear from God before we speak. Mm -hmm. Jesus, it says in John 12, didn't speak anything unless he heard it from the Father. He didn't do anything unless he was instructed by the Father. Yeah. So if we do that, and if we are speaking the Word of God, mm -hmm. how can you take credit for what another man said? Yeah. You, you can't. Um, there's one particular sermon that I probably, because I'm not in the habit of, I don't repeat sermons a lot, mm -hmm. and that's something I've had to be healed of because mm -hmm. it's like, uh, you know, just because somebody heard it over here doesn't mean somebody shouldn't hear it over there. Yeah. But a lot of times it's like, okay, I, I've got to come up with something new. I don't have to come up with something new. Mm -hmm. So I say there's one sermon that I preached, virtually around the world. Mm -hmm. Every time I preach it, I, I, I know that it blesses other people, but I don't think it blesses anybody as much as it blesses me. And regardless of how many times I hear it, Me I get too. blessed by it because it's the Word of God. Yeah, and right. I get blessed by the Word of God. Every time I hear yeah. the Word of God. But I, had, I don't think, and I think you'll uh, abide by this, I don't think I've ever preached a sermon. It's called The Attitude of the Righteous. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever preached that sermon where I haven't had pastors or other pre preachers come up to me afterwards mm -hmm. and say, do you mind if I use that? Right. Right. Uh, yeah. And I, I am gracious and loving. Mm -hmm. And don't holler at him or anything, mm -hmm. because it's such a foolish question when you stop and think about it. Of course, because that is a beautiful sermon. It is yeah. a marvelous sermon. It is a wonderful sermon. Mm -hmm. And I can God. say that without ever boasting, because I it's not I didn't author it. No. Yeah. You know, it is it is all that sermon is all the Apostle Paul okay. from the letter to the Philippians, mm -hmm. and Paul will tell you, well, he didn't originate it. It came from the Lord. That's right. Yeah. So, therefore, I can't, how can I take any credit for it? Yeah, absolutely. And when people come up and say, oh, what a wonderful sermon. It's like, why, why, I mean, I understand how we have this, it's a human desire. Yeah. But the simple fact of the matter is, this isn't my word. Yeah. It's, you know, it's all, it's, it's all from the word of God. Yeah. But when we do that, when we just, you know, kind of say, oh, thank you very much, thank you very much. Yeah. You've gotten your reward. Well, we're stealing from God. Yes. What we're doing is we're getting between Him and, and the reflection of the, yeah. the light. We're That's blocking right. the light. Right. That's right. Um, this present world, it says that the world is in darkness. The people in deep darkness yeah. in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And it's like the last thing in the world we need to do in our ministry of reconciliation when I say we, I mean each and every Christian, yeah, yeah. is to get in the way of the light of God. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> John says that the light came into the world. Jesus came into the world, but men love the darkness. Mm. Yeah. Men love the darkness because they can get away and hide. They try and hide their mm. sin. Right? We come out of that tomb in new life. Mm -hmm. We come out carrying all this baggage. Mm -hmm. That baggage blocks the reflection of Jesus Christ yes, in our life. Yes. It's not so much what we do new as much as what we put off old. Mm -hmm. When Paul writes to the Romans and says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, mm -hmm. <coughs> it also, Paul also said that we have been given the mind of Christ. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're creating something new. We're just getting rid of the old things that block mm -hmm. that, that yeah. mind of Christ. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, people want to run off and get doctorates in divinity and theology, and, mm -hmm. you know, so they can get this new... Re that, that's not going to give you uh, that new mind. It may give you more knowledge. Yeah. But I would remind you that the Word of God says that knowledge puffs up, love builds up. And oftentimes, all that knowledge that we get so prideful about blocks the light of God. Okay. Because knowledge puffs up. When it puffs up, it's building man up. Yeah, yeah. But love builds up. And love, God is love. Yeah, yeah. So, I would well, talk about, because you, you mentioned, um, when we talked about this earlier today, about the, um, the laser and the prism. Well, again, it just goes back to understanding light. And as I as I was in this sure. study, um, I I said I, I was looking at this, and uh, I was led to think about like lasers. Mm -hmm. Laser is light, yes. just a beam of light, yeah. and yet a laser can cut through solid steel. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty amazing when you think about mm -hmm. it. It's incredible. But all it is, it's it's excited mm -hmm. laser. I mean, it's light that is. Amplified and excited mm, yeah. and unified. Yeah. So it takes a whole bunch of light and narrows it down to one little they join little, together. Join together beam. And Unity. It to, and it has the power to cut through anything. Mm. That's what our unity in the body of Christ can do. Yeah. Whereas opposed to that, you have a prism. Mm -hmm. Now a prism is a, a, a block like a block of glass, for example, mm -hmm. where where a light goes in. You can put pure white light mm -hmm. in. And it divides, mm -hmm. and it goes out many, many colors. Yeah, and it may look very pretty to you because it's many, many colors. But the fact is, it has absolutely no power. It's virtually, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not bright enough to light a room. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not. It's not good for anything. No, it looks pretty, but it's not really good yeah. for anything. It's yeah. a decoration. Well, that's yeah, what a divided. Exactly. That's what a divided church is. Yes. That's what a divided body of Christ is. It may look pretty mm -hmm. to yeah. a lot of people, but it's useless. Yes. So we need to to get that focus. You know, we need to be in that place where we are allowing the Christ to be reflected in our life. We need to be faithful in being ambassadors for Christ. Mm -hmm. We need to get understand that it, that it is what we have carried into new life, out of the old life, that hides that light, that keeps us from looking like Jesus Christ, from keeps people from seeing Christ Jesus in us. Mm -hmm. The, the great, great example is when Lazarus came out of the tomb. How many people saw Lazarus when he came out of the tomb? Was it three? No, nobody. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> no, I, it's that, it, sounds like a, it sounds like a trick oh, question. Course, yeah. Yeah. But the fact is, you know, I mean, you could see this thing coming out of the tomb yeah. and you, may, you, Lazarus, you, yeah. you knew it was Lazarus. Yes. But the fact is, you couldn't see Lazarus yeah, okay. <clears throat> because he's completely covered. <clears throat> and that, in the same way, and that's when Jesus came out of the tomb, he was covered, you know, yeah, they were all covered. gone. He was, yeah, yeah. Uh, all of the cloths of death and everything were gone. So it's like, you know, people don't see, we need to make sure that we're not wearing any of that stuff mm -hmm. that, that is literally hiding Christ from us. Yes. Or hiding Christ from the world. Um, <clears throat> we were really, really blessed, I, I think, the other day, that... It's actually because of this study that I, you know, first talked to one of the pastors when we first came into Northern uh, England here. This is North England, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he was getting ready to put on a conference, and one of the verses that that I had said just struck him so much that he literally built this conference around that, mm -hmm. and that was uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter one verse eight, where it talks about that God will punish. The sons of the king. That's us. The yeah. king's kids. Yeah. Because they're dressed in foreign garments. Yeah. Uh, we're dressed in foreign garments all too often. And those foreign things, are, those strange things, or alien things is, is you know, kind of what it says. We need to not hide Jesus Christ from the world. Mm -hmm. It needs to become the passion of our life mm -hmm. to show Him. Well, when we had this conference, which took place earlier this week, there were, there were three of us preaching. It was myself and two other fellows from mm -hmm. Nigeria. And I don't believe those two fellows had ever met. And so the three of yeah. us had never met before. Yeah. 
the three of us came together for this day-long conference mm -hmm. and none of us knew what the other was going to speak mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. But when we came together and we spoke, you know, um, I think one fellow spoke first and then I yeah. spoke for an hour and then another mm -hmm. fellow. But it says in, uh, that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you could see how intertwined yeah. these three messages were. Yeah. And again, none of us knew what, what no, we were going to talk about. Spirit. But all three of us literally had the same revelation from God. Yeah. Yeah. That it was about the traditions of the church yeah. that is hiding Jesus Christ, that are hiding Jesus yes. Christ from the people of the world. Yes. Yeah. And that we need to, as a church, we need to repent mm -hmm. and put those things away, put those things off, mm -hmm. that Christ might be visible in us. Yes. Um, we're, we're a church bound up in traditions, bound up mm -hmm. in, in foreign clothes, bound yeah. up in alien clothes. <clears throat> it, it's, in, it's interesting that that verse in Zephaniah talks about, it uses the term, I think, in both the King James, or in King James it may say strange, in the New American Standard it says foreign clothes. Mm -hmm. But they're alien. Yeah. And what they are is because they don't we're, belong. Well, they don't belong because actually one of the Bible guys I did recently was about being dressed, and it's there on yeah. the, still available on the site. Um, you know, being dressed in robes of righteousness, being dressed in the armor of light, being dressed yeah. in the whole armor of God, yeah. and ultimately putting on putting on love yeah. and putting on Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. So that's what we're supposed to be clothed in. Yeah. And we're, we're clothed in the trappings of the world. Yes. We, we oftentimes want to look like the world so the world will accept us. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact is, that's what Paul was saying when he wrote to Timothy and said, study to show yourself approved unto God a worker. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be approved unto the world yeah. and be approved unto God. Mm -hmm. Because their goals are too different. Right. Yeah. The goals of the world are to accumulate more stuff get more yeah. power, have more Love wealth, it. more yeah. power. That's what the world is all about. Yes. What is the desire of God? God desires that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. The only thing that matters to the Lord is souls. Hmm. The eternal life of people. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in economy by any means, but I, I know this. I watch, because we're here in the United Kingdom, from the United States, and we are we are greatly affected by the exchange rate between the U.S. dollar and the pound sterling, and between the euro, and it fluctuates. Mm -hmm. It goes up and down, up and down, up yeah. and down. Never in our favor, by the <laughs> But the one thing that seems to be more steady is gold. Yeah, right. Gold has always been at this point. Well, but but, but gold has always been the ultimate object of wealth. Right. Yeah. How highly does God regard gold? Well, the streets are going to be paved with it. Yeah, they use it as pavement. In heaven? In heaven, it's nothing more than pavement. The streets are paved mm -hmm. with gold. Okay. It's cobblestones. All those, all those things that you treasure you know, in the world mm -hmm. so highly mm -hmm. are just going to be tromped underfoot. Okay. It doesn't impress the Lord. Oh. The things that impress the world are not the things that impress God. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate part is that the things that impress God are not the things that impress the world. Mm -hmm. But we need to treasure the things of God in our heart. When it says in Psalm 8 to consider the moon and the stars, the work of His hands, what is man that thou dost consider him? But God exalts me. God has given man dominion. Everything in God's creation. This world was built to be inhabited by man. That's what the Word of God says. It's all about us and our relationship with Him. That's the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. But the church has reduced that to getting people to visit a church building once a week. Yeah. That's not a relationship with God. No. A relationship with God is when you wake up in the morning spend time. and you, like David, have a heart yeah. that can call out that this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it because it's His. Yeah. And start that way. And that when you go to bed, you can meditate on His Word at night, like David did. Mm -hmm. I mean, that it's a relationship that goes from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. So we need to come to this place. I, I was mentioned today, too, that because an issue that I deal with all the time, 
and I run across all the time because it's a big issue, is Christian involvement in politics. Yes. And that's true whether you're in the United States or the United Kingdom, whether you're in Cameroon, West Africa, mm -hmm. it, it yeah. seems to just flow through. The fact of the matter is, the world is not going to be changed by politicians. No. Because politicians, throughout the ages, throughout the times, throughout the world, still... Self-interest. Well, even 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 if they go in good-hearted, I mean, it's it's a yeah. it's a it's a, it's a corrupt system. Yeah. It is a corrupt system. And and regardless of what you think or what you've been taught or what your theology is, if you believe the Word of God, you have to believe this: that even after New Testament, mm -hmm. New Testament times, after the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection yeah. of Jesus Christ, after the Day of Pentecost, mm -hmm. after all of that, the Word of God says this, and John writes in his letter. Mm -hmm that we know that this present world is in the power of the evil one. Yes. That's going to be true until you hear the sound of a trumpet, till you hear the shout of a voice of the archangel, till you hear the hoofbeats of that white horse being ridden by Jesus Christ coming That's back. Right. Mm -hmm. Until that day, this world is going to be in the power of the evil one. That's, right. yeah. that's, that's a fact, because that's what the Word of God says. Yeah. And you can you can debate it, you can think about it all you want, but that's what the Word of God says. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can have seminars, you can teach about it, but that's what the Word of God says. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's what the Word of God is going to say. Yeah. Because heaven and earth will pass away, but God says His Word will stand forever. Yeah. But we're getting to a place where we need to understand the, that the world and the Word are in opposition. Yeah. We need to stop striving to make friends with the world. Because it says that if you make friends with the world, you made an enemy of God. That's what it says. New Testament. So we have to get to that place where our life is about pleasing God. Mm. That where our life is about being approved by God. Mm. And the only way that happens is when He sees that faith in our lives built up by His Word. Yeah. When we have put aside all the trappings of the world. Yeah. When they become unimportant to us. I mentioned gold before. It says in Job 22 that, that God expects us, wants us, tells us, instructs us to take our gold, the gold of Ophir, which was the finest gold, and throw it in, his, in the dust. Right. And he says, and then I will become your gold. Mm. Yeah. It says in the Psalms, in Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Well, when you delight yourself in the Lord, He becomes the desire of your heart. The church needs to get to that place where we stop seeking respectability, where we stop seeking the approval of the world, mm -hmm. where we stop seeking to be mixed with the world, yes. where we stop believing that we can become part of the world and change the world, mm -hmm. where we stop believing that we have replaced Jesus Christ yeah. and start believing that we are just here to reflect Him, mm -hmm. to reflect the light of His love, to reflect His power, to reflect His grace, to bring that message of reconciliation to God the Father. That is all that matters. Nothing else matters. And for all of the people who think otherwise, I just want to tell you, you can't make a deal with Goliath. No. No. You can't make a deal with Goliath. You've got to deal with the devil. That's right. Now, Remember, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Yeah. And the weapons of our warfare are yeah. divinely powerful. Yeah. It is the sword of the Word of God. It yeah. is the Word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword in this world. Right. And it is that Word that brings the power of God's love, mm -hmm. the power of God's grace into the world. Mm -hmm. We need to stop playing church. We need to stop thinking about building about buildings. and mm -hmm. That's what, uh, what the church is all about and just going out and participating with God in His plan. And His plan is to build His church. He said, I will build it. That's right. But He's building it out of living stones. Yes. There hasn't been an architectural rendering done here. Mm -hmm. I promise you, you will not find Jesus Christ going into a church this week to try and raise funds to build a building. No. No. You may find other people doing it, but you won't find Him doing it. Yeah. He spoke that moon into existence with a word. He spoke the stars into existence and named them with a word. God spoke everything that you see into existence with a word. He, that's his building plan. And you want to know something? He built it. It's done. It's a done deal. 
completely. So all we have to do is get out of the way. All we have to do is step step outside of that, that path where the world is standing between us and Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. the, you want to know something? The sun's not going to move. No. Everything goes around the sun. The sun it's, it's not like the sun is going around the earth. Yeah. And, and people that ever thought that never got that idea from scriptures, by the way. Mm. Okay? It's, you know, they had an idea that the earth was stationary and everything went around it. That there's no justification. Well, that's a that, that is a self centered approach. Yes. Mm. Things rotate around the sun. That's Things right. still rotate around the sun. Mm. Okay? We just, we need to step out from the world. The sun's not going to move. We have the power to move. That's right. That's right. It's a choice. What that is called, in a word, is repentance. Mm -hmm. We need to seek God, His forgiveness, and His grace yes. for the fact that we failed to take off those things we carried into our new life from our old life. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he wrote to the Colossians, and he said, put off the old self. He wrote to the Romans and said, mm -hmm. put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the message of this entire study about Lazarus. Yes. That is being available, just being there and available yeah. for the light of Jesus Christ to shine off you into the world. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Like, where did you ever hear that before? You know where you heard that? In the throne of God. In the year of Uzziah's death. Isaiah found himself in the throne room of God. Mm -hmm. He saw God high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, Who shall I send? And Isaiah said, Here I am, Lord. Mm -hmm. Send me. I'm here, and I'm available. Mm -hmm. The Lord's not looking for anything else in our lives. He's not impressed by our clothes, our cars, our wealth, our bank account, our buildings. Our, our He's not... Impressed in the least by the, the letters after the, your name that indicate what a great brain you are. You're not supposed to be using your brain. The Word of God says, lean not on your own understanding. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Right. What it is, is be here and available. So I, I, I'm going to end it here and just say, Father, we just thank you, Lord thank you, God. Lord, that, that you can choose to use us, mm. imperfect as we are. The same way you chose to use the moon to reflect your light, Lord God. Even though it had no light of its own. Even though it's so imperfect. Even though it's not such a, a good man-made reflector. It is what you have chosen to show forth your light. And we rejoice that you have chosen us to show forth your light, to reflect your light. Yes, Jesus. Lord, help us not to put anything between us that would block that light. Help us, Lord God, just to be here and available. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.